All right, guys, welcome back to the Atlas Hour. Today we have a special guest, uh, attorney Rick Collins. Um, Rick specializes in all things hormones, supplements, fitness. He's been in the fitness space for a long time. His uh, legal practice kind of surrounds this whole space that we talk about, so it's awesome. Um, I've been a fan of Rick's for years. I've seen him write in magazines. I've caught him on many podcasts. I had the opportunity honor to meet him earlier this year, which was awesome and listen to him speak. So I wanted to get him on to share some knowledge with you. So welcome, Rick. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me on. Great, great to be with you guys. Yeah, I gave you a little bit of a, an intro there, but for those listeners who might not know you, maybe you can give us a bit of a background into who you are and what you do and, and where you're at now. Sure. So uh, I come from initially the bodybuilding background, the bodybuilding world. Before I ever went to law school, I was a bodybuilder, uh, competed as a bodybuilder through college, um, walked the walk, you know, talked the talk, the, the whole thing. Um, it's in my blood. I, I still lift heavy. I still train hard. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, that was like one, one journey, one, one course that I, that I took in life. Um, like every 17, 18, 19 year old kid, uh, who's living, sleeping and eating bodybuilding, you think, oh, I, I want to get a pro card. I want to, you know, move forward in bodybuilding. Um, I didn't go in that direction. Instead, I went to law school, um, stopped competing, um, went from law school to uh, work in a prosecutor's office. So putting the, the bad guys in jail for five years, um, loved that job, and then went into private practice and started representing people who were accused of crimes and tried a lot of cases of, of all different types, criminal criminal matters. Um, and that, you know, timing is everything they say in life. And, and it, it's amazing because the year that I went into private practice, which was 1990, left the DA's office and, and went into a, a partnership with, with my other two partners at the time, was the year that Congress decided that testosterone and anabolic steroids should be treated like cocaine and heroin and, and you know, methamphetamine and put into the Controlled Substances Act. And so suddenly you've got this collision, right? You've got the gyms and, and the, the bodybuilders who up until 1990 didn't really think of this, would never have imagined that the DEA would be involved in steroid cases. And then suddenly you've got the legal court system, the police agents who suddenly are tasked with being involved with and investigating these these hormones that you know they didn't really even understand. There's talk about roid rage. Um, Lyle Alzado was a... a uh, NFL player at the time who claimed that steroids gave him brain cancer. And so you've got all this stuff out there and a lot of misinformation floating around. And, and you know, I had sort of a foot in each of those worlds for a number of years. And so people started to come to me either for information or because they were at some point maybe arrested or investigated for something involving steroids or or a testosterone or um, anything like, you know, any type of synthetic um, hormones. And, and I wound up getting a bigger and bigger involvement in sort of where that intersection was. And so over the years, my practice became more and more kind of where hardcore health and fitness meet the law. I've probably represented more people on anabolic steroid, growth hormones, SARMs, <laughs> peptides, uh, th things marketed as research chemicals under questionable circumstances, um, uh, doping cases with athletes, uh, with police officers, with other people who, for whatever, military people who might be tested for anabolic steroids and might test positive um, than any lawyer on the planet. Um, I've, I've done enormous amounts of that work. And, uh, and it led to a broadening of my practice too. I've, I've represented many, many dietary supplement companies and sports nutrition companies. Originally, kind of because of the pro-hormone, there was a period of time where certain loophole anabolic steroids were being sold over the counter as dietary supplement products. And, um, and so I wound up representing a number of companies in, in that realm, which ultimately led to representing everybody making, you know, people making protein 
powders and creatine and all sorts of different types of primarily sports nutrition, but even other types of natural products. So my, my practice is, is kind of where health and fitness intersect with legal criminal regulatory law. Uh, I'm the happiest lawyer I know because I was able to kind of meld my vocation and avocation. And having started out as a as a bodybuilder, I ran a personal training business. I was a personal trainer, um, um, CSCS uh, and through NSCA. So I, I, I've i got the base of knowledge of, of training and, and nutrition. Um, and it, it's great. I like, you know, I like the people I represent. I feel good about what I do. Uh, many of my clients become my friends. If you look on my social media, there's yeah. lots of folks who I represented over years and years ago who continue to kind of want to be part of my journey and, and want to be, you know, with me on, on the various uh, adventures that I have. And um, so I, I, I love what I do and I appreciate your, your having me on the show. Yeah. How cool is that? Who Like, you know, as a bodybuilder, become an attorney, you probably never thought that you would get to do both in one. That's no, awesome. I, I never, never imagined it. You know, there's a, yeah. there's a great book uh, by uh, Malcolm Gladwell called uh, outliers. And it, it looks at what, what makes somebody successful, right? I mean, is it timing? Is it hard work? Is it who your parents are? Is it your intelligence? And he looks at each chapter, looks at a different factor and you realize how important timing is timing is just a huge important and the and the chapter on timing is actually about lawyers and so for me it really it, it drove the point home you know had i had i you know become a lawyer maybe 10 years earlier or 10 years later I, I I wouldn't have had this same kind of opportunity in this same journey and so I'm I'm very blessed and very grateful right that's awesome well, you brought up a, a big thing there, which was the legality around hormones. And I don't know if people realize um, that these things were not really regulated up until, like you said, around 1990. Can you give us some of the background on hormones in this country and the, the legality around them? Yeah. So so one name stands out and it's Ben Johnson. You, you may remember um, that um, and some may may remember that back in 1988 in, at the Seoul Olympics, uh, a Canadian sprinter by the name of Ben Johnson became the fastest man alive, ran the 100 meters, broke the records, just an amazing uh, actually beat Carl Lewis, who was the American. So the Canadian beat the American and then test positive for Winstrol. And so the sports world at that time just was turned upside down. Suddenly you've got this, this, you know, cheating in sports, this scourge of steroids that could undermine sports integrity and, and even people's belief in the, in the, you know, uh, moral core of what sports are all about. Is this just going to become a chemical contest between mm -hmm. athletes who are just doping up? And so, the United States Congress uh, started holding a bunch of hearings in the late 1980s to try to figure out what are we going to do? How do we get steroids out of sports? And their solution was to make steroids a controlled substance and put it into the same law with heroin and, and cocaine and, and methamphetamine and you know all of the other traditional narcotics and drugs of abuse. Now, interestingly, the regulatory bodies sent people to testify before Congress, and those witnesses all said, don't do it. The DEA, the FDA, the National Institute on Drug Abuse, the American Medical Association all sent representatives to testify and say to Congress, you know, steroids are not like that. They don't belong in this in the same act with those traditional drugs of abuse and narcotics. There's, there's gotta be some other way to keep them out of sports, but we, we shouldn't take that step. They don't meet the criteria for addiction, dependency and abuse. And certainly at that time, there was very, very little evidence uh, of, of anything that would connect steroids to the sort of addictive qualities that other types of of uh, narcotics and, and uh, controlled substances would meet. Congress um, decided to ignore all of the, the expert witnesses and forge ahead and make uh, anabolic steroids, including testosterone, into a controlled substance. And that law went into effect in 1991. 
And that really changed the game because up until that point, most of the steroids that were being sold to athletes or or cosmetic users, people who, you know, weren't really competing in sports, but just wanted to look better without a shirt on, which has always been the vast majority of people who are using anabolic steroids non-medically. Um, up until then, you know, it was um, it was largely a diverted market. So there were FDA approved medicines that maybe maybe some of the big pharma companies were making more than they should have, but it, it, and some were handy, you know, winding up the hands of of bodybuilders. And so you had friendly pharmacists and but it was it was FDA approved product. Once the, the law went into effect and, and kind of big pharma is now under scrutiny and, and a much higher level of recording and reporting, suddenly the, the you know, FDA approved products are disappearing off the market. And I think we all know that where there's a demand, there's going to be a supply, basic, mm -hmm. basic laws of economics. But guys, so what happened was uh, alternative sources uh, started to appear. And in the early 90s, a, a lot of it was coming from Mexico there was a period of time where there was a lot of a lot of uh, products that had pictures of animals on them they were veterinary products um, you know you have a picture of a horse or a dog on a, on a 10 cc vial and of course these were being made for humans but they were being labeled for veterinary use because there were some some lesser restrictions to try to get it into into the country that way and so uh, and then that ultimately led to as they started to crack down on that to uh, products coming from Europe and, and other places, finished products. Ultimately, when it became harder and harder to bring finished products into the United States, um, then the product uh, market morphed again and into what it is now, which is basically the steroid black market is Chinese powders that are mm -hmm. imported here, um, often labeled as something else, and uh, received by a remailer who will mail it to the chemist. The chemist has some rudimentary understanding of, of how to uh, sterify um, or maybe has a pill press and takes those powders, those raw powders, and makes them into finished product and then sells them on, on Instagram or on <laughs> other social media platforms. I mean, that's that's where we are. And so when you think about if, if the government's purpose in the original law was to get steroids out of sports back in, in 1990, 91, well, we've had plenty of scandals since then. I represented the chemist in the Balco case. There's been a, a million uh, sports doping scandals since then. Hello, Lance Armstrong. So, so I'm not sure it successfully did that. If it was intended to try to protect teenagers from getting steroids, well, I think whenever you, you know, you I mean, you can call it the Anabolic Steroid Control Act, but it actually removed the control of the government and ballooned the black market. So there was much less control over who gets anabolic steroids. And then, of course, from a public health standpoint, we went from FDA approved products that were made in under good manufacturing practice uh, requirements um, to some guy in his kitchen, you know, mixing some stuff and, and putting it together. And, and I represent a lot of people in this industry. Um, and I can tell you, some of them are absolutely meticulous, fastidious about, you know, their quality control to make sure that, you know, it's just the right amount of benzyl alcohol and sodium benzoate and, and that it's properly dosed to exactly what it's labeled as. But I've also represented some people who were not very fastidious, who were yeah. who were not, you know, very clean. And and the idea that some of these products would end up being injected into somebody, you know, far away, who somebody who bought it online is is, is troubling. So um, I'm not sure that the law accomplished its goals and certainly it led to some very problematic outcomes as well. Absolutely. So prior to 91, could I go to my physician and say I'm going on vacation in a few months, I'm looking to shed some pounds and maybe put on some 
you know, lean mass and, and be prescribed a hormone potentially? Or was it more like it is now where if you prescribe these, it has to be for a medical reason? I think it was always uh, something that I, I probably just medical ethics, I'm not sure would have accepted at that time, putting legalities aside, the idea of using it cosmetically. Uh, don't forget, this was this was before the explosion of sort of cosmetic medicine. Um, yeah. Botox wasn't, you know, yeah. nobody was doing Botox or liposuction or, or fillers or any of the stuff now that has become just, you know, part of, of social culture and, and accepted, you know, I, yeah. I, I rarely see, you know, 20 something girls without some of that lip filler now True. in certain areas. So, yeah. um, so I think we've kind of changed, um, um, but, um, but certainly, the, the law made it so that you could not prescribe because you can't do any kind of prescription for a controlled substance that is not medical. It has to be medical. And, right. you know, so, you know, hey, I want, I want bigger pecs or, you know, uh, I mean, you, you can certainly one of the ironies is is that from a cosmetic standpoint, you can go to a cosmetic plastic surgeon and you yeah. can say, you know what, I want bigger pecs. Uh, my calves are lacking. I do, I, I do a million calf raises. They won't grow. Let's stick some prostheses in there mm -hmm. and make them bigger. And by the way, you know, my triceps are bigger than my biceps. We could do some bicep implants. We can do some chest implants. And all of these things exist now, and they're all perfectly legal and comport with medical ethics, even though there's no physical need for it. Um, probably with greater risks than, than certainly supervised Absolutely. anabolic steroid. I yeah. mean, it, yeah, I, years ago, there was a story of a, a kid who went to Mexico because he wanted to get cheaper calf implants. It didn't go well. He came back. They were infected. It was a double amputation of his wow. legs. So, you know, there's, there's real risks. You know, people have died on the liposuction table for vanity yeah. alone. And mm -hmm. look, we're a vain culture, you know, I mean, that's that, that's the reality. There's some of that in all of us. And there's some bigorexia, I think, in in all of us as well. Um, I think every bodybuilder who's ever stepped on stage has some wow. level of of muscle dysmorphia, you know, mm -hmm. maybe not qualifying as a um, as a pathology, but, you know, always wanting more, always, you know, wanting to be you know bigger or more cut. And to some degree, I think that's a good thing because. If there's if there's no discomfort with how you are in a particular area, you're never going to be motivated to change it, right? I mean, sure, the only sure. reason, yeah. you know, why go to the gym if you if you think you look great? You know, it, it's that it's that you know what I want to be in better shape. I want to, you know, I, I think that's true of any accomplishment. You know, comfort yeah. uh, is not a motivator. Discomfort is the motivator. Hundred um, percent. Just to piggyback off of kind of what Rick is saying here, just to look at, the, I'm going to say the absurdity of it all. So, like as Rick's saying, you know, you can get a cosmetic procedure, or let's just talk about injectables. Botox. Botox is literally the most toxic substance on earth. Like I remember learning this in ochem in undergrad. Botulinum mm -hmm. toxin definitely is is the most per you know. Um, per quantity, the most toxic substance that there is. So you can go get that injected because you say, I want less wrinkles or I want my face to look a certain way, but you can't get a hormone that literally, I don't think that there's a, an LD50 for testosterone. I don't think you can kill somebody by injecting right. too, unless you give them a, an oil embolus, but the actual, you know, testosterone, you cannot kill somebody. Right. But in each one of our state licenses, there's a big paragraph in mine that says, that I cannot prescribe testosterone or growth hormone or any anabolic for the use of performance enhancing or changing a physique. So it's just so crazy, you know, like, yeah, just like it, it, it doesn't make any sense from a health perspective, uh, from a risk perspective. But I, I think the, the difference is that fillers, Botox, liposuction are not going to make you beat the American Carl Lewis in a in a hundred meters. Yep. And yep. It, it's not, I mean, that that's really what yeah. it's about. It was really about yeah. sports. And and I yep. you know that the one of the great ironies, of course, is that the vast majority of folks who are using testosterone or other anabolic steroids non-medically are not competing against the Carl mm -hmm. Lewis's of the world. They're not competing in anything. They haven't competed since, you know, Little League very, very often. Um, and so uh, it, it's ironic. You know, a couple of years ago, I was involved in a, a study 
that um, we looked at some 2,000 uh, anabolic steroid users, almost you know, almost 2,000 in in the U.S. And we did this um, anonymous, um, completely um, exhaustive kind of analysis. Uh, with lots and lots of questions, surveying them on everything from their demographics to their motivations, to their income, to their education. We found that the average anabolic steroid user, non-medical steroid user in America is an above average uh, income, above average intelligence and, and education, um, who is using it for purely cosmetic reasons, basically to, to look better. Average age, I think, came out to around 30. Uh, most people did not start during their teens, uh, very, a very small percentage. Um, and so it's basically a, a 20, 30s and, and up uh, kind of um, drug for people who are using it for essentially the same per reason that a, a person would get filler, Botox, or breast implants, you know, you, you know, you can imagine um, what what would happen if we outlawed some of those things, or even criticized some of those things. You know, I, I think mm -hmm. there's this idea that look, everybody should be able to do what they want with their own body. There should be some personal autonomy over how you have what you do with your body. If you want to, if you would feel better with bigger breasts, then why should anybody interfere with that? It's there's nothing, mm -hmm. nothing wrong with that. That's perfectly fine. Or if you want to get filler or a facelift or whatever, but yet we we think of it so differently with respect to these hormones. Um, we would never say that a woman should be denied estrogen as as you know as required. But somehow I think the sports stigma, um, that cheating stigma is attached to testosterone and anabolic steroids in a way that it doesn't attach to any other cosmetic lifestyle sort of drug or procedure. And, and I, I'm not sure we'll ever get quite past that. There's, we can yeah. talk a little bit about how a different population now has been using testosterone and, you know, we we'll talk about the trans community in, in a little mm -hmm. while, but, um, but I'm not getting past that cheating for the rest of the folks who are using it non-medically is, is very difficult. I, I, I should just add that that law in 1990 um, was kind of limited. I, I think you know they ignored the the experts, and and so it wasn't the best law, and it didn't include a lot of steroids that um, you know people could use, and so. Um, Based on that, you know, the, the limitations of that law in the late 90s, uh, there were a bunch of crafty chemists who started looking at blowing off the dust off some mm -hmm. old, you know, textbooks on, on hormones and chemicals and started actually marketing as, as products these sort of loopholed steroidal um, configurations, these metabolites or, or different analogs of anabolic steroids. And so that became the pro-hormone market. Mm -hmm. In 2004, Congress said, oops, I, you know, we need, now we need to deal with this. The, the 1990 law wasn't uh, effective enough. And so a new law was passed, the Anabolic Steroid Control Act of 2004. And so mm -hmm. that went for a while. And then there were still deficits and loopholes in that. I'm talking about, you know, the, the gang that couldn't shoot straight, right? So now in 2014, Congress had to reconvene with a new law. Now it was called the Designer Anabolic Steroid Control Act. And that that pretty much decimated the, the pro-hormone market by being more expansive than any of the previous laws. Um, but you know, you wonder some, it makes you wonder just looking at the, the way that the, the, the steroid legislation played out federally, how much Congress really knows and how careful and thorough they are in, in making any laws um, mm -hmm. and, and who's advising them on it. Yeah. And so, Rick, you, oh, sorry, Adam. No, go ahead. Go. Well, and I was just going to say, you know, I grew up and I was born in 95. So I was once coming up kind of in the pro hormone era. And I've always wondered, you know, I watched many of young friends go into GNC and supplement stores back then and buy things that were, you know, basically anabolic compounds and mess up with their hormone profile at a young age. And I've always wondered that 
could we have negated a lot of younger kids getting their hands on these things by just leaving it in the hands of the medical professionals, never putting those laws into effect. And there are probably many people that, again, got their hands on them just through a store and didn't even realize what they were taking um, and had longstanding issues because of it, rather than if we just had not, you know, looped it into the law that obviously went into play in 1991. Right. Yeah. No, it's um, that's a great question that we probably can never we'll never know the real answer. But I, I tend to think that when when Congress acts to um, shut down legitimate sources of supply of something, mm -hmm. that it's going to be an automatic growth of a black market of of, you know, cagey alternatives and ways yeah. to try to get around it or to sell it covertly. And so you you lose control and it winds up in the hands of, like you say, kids who, you know, uh, otherwise would have been prevented because the doctor wouldn't prescribe it, let's say, to the 17 year old or I think the vast majority of doctors wouldn't. And so you have I, I think you probably would have had a lesser black market. I, I you know, the, the studies, you know, statistics do show that when the 1990 law went into effect, uh, in the years that followed, the black market just, you know, went crazy. Yeah. And possibly a lot, of, maybe a lot of abuse that can't, not that people were not using more than they should before the law went into effect, but having a much larger quantity in circulation, I'm sure allowed, you know, because I feel like the early 2000s, really up until the last few years, there was a lot of abuse with compounds. So it being right. more readily available on the black market possibly opened up that to it as well. Well, that and even, even to add to that, when you remove the big pharmaceutical companies, and then you remove the, the you know, actual pharmacists, and, and then you remove the physicians. So you've taken the whole medical establishment out of the equation. That's never going to be good. Even putting yeah. aside the lack of quality of the black market products, you've now got no supervision. And you've mm -hmm. stigmatized it through the law to a degree where at least, you know, up until sort of the the, the blooming of, of TRT and TRT clinics, there was a period of time where doctors just, and, and still to some degree, the general practitioner wants nothing to do with anabolic steroids. You, you get out of my office. So mm -hmm. you're, you're going to have less supervision, less guidance, less advice, less monitoring. And all of that can, as you say, lead to either ex more dangerous, excessive doses or people who don't get their health checked, to who don't get screenings, could have some sort of contraindications to the use of anabolic steroids. You got some guy taking, you know, two grams of, of gear a week, and and you know he's he doesn't realize that he's got some you know pre-existing medical conditions, whether it's heart issues or he's got some he's taking lots of orals and he's not having his you know liver function analyzed ever, um, you know. So there's there's lots of bad things that happen when you um, kind of shut down legitimate sources of supply. So listening to, uh, you know, you, I think any listener, even if they're not, you know, into this space would say, this seems kind of crazy and absurd. As I said, has anyone kind of lobbied Congress or tried to push back against this law in recent years? I'm seeing a parallel kind of in my own head play out like kind of reminds me of marijuana in a way where it was extremely criminalized. And then, you know, we, we kind of went into this niche of uh, marijuana clinics, which I feel like we're in TRT now, where it kind of reminds me of how marijuana was a decade ago, where you could say, oh, my back hurts, and then go get some legal marijuana. And now eventually most states are catching on. Do you think that's going to happen with this law? Will, will we decriminalize this ever? And maybe this is where the trade uh, excuse me, the trans talk comes in. Right, right. Um, but have, have there been people at question just why are we doing this? Because it seems yeah. really stupid. Yeah. I mean, there have been a number of law review articles uh, written over the years questioning whether this made sense. Um, obviously, I've had 25 years of clients coming to me and asking me this question. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, yeah. look, I'm I'm a law abiding guy. Um, I've never been arrested before until now. And, and now I'm suddenly a federal drug criminal because uh, I I'm not afraid of steroids. I, I, I like them and, and I I 
have no problem with using them or selling them. I, I you know, and suddenly now you've you've forced me into this into this situation. Will there ever be a change? Will there ever be some sort of uh, legal lobby for the bodybuilding community for the the folks who are using steroids? And and I think the answer was no. Certainly until very recently. Um, and and bodybuilders have had no real lobbying. Uh, the constituency has had no real voice. I mean, I've written through the years and I've I've criticized the the Anabolic Steroid Control Act and the way that it's been implemented. Um, I've questioned whether steroids should be controlled substances at all. There are, there are other ways that we could have kept them out of sports, kept them away from teenagers, made sure that people were using them safely, limited the doses. There, there are all sorts of other mechanisms that we could have used and instead of this, you know, you know, broad uh, approach, you know, to to the problem. But um, but no, I, I think for many years the the cheating component to it, the you know, the as the average person that that was never that kind of stigma was never attached to marijuana, uh, mm -hmm. and marijuana doesn't enhance performance typically, so or it's not seen that way. So um, I think that that sort of cheating thing is part of it. I also think that for the average person, a hypermuscular physique is kind of threatening. You know, um, I think there's an aspect of that. Um, and when you combine it with the the idea of hyper aggressive behavior that testosterone or steroids can enhance aggression and we could talk about that for hours. And I think that's a, a whole very interesting topic of, of whether testosterone causes aggression. And I've written a lot about that. But um, but I think that when you put the sort of a hyper muscular, a 250 pound you know, jacked up guy that the the public who is much smaller and weaker um, looks at. And I think as a culture and society, we've gotten weaker and weaker in many ways, in, mm -hmm. in many ways. Um, but I think that, that threatening aspect is different than than marijuana. And so I I I, I never really saw the opportunity to change that uh, un, until recently. And as as you you if you follow me on social media, I, I post a lot about this stuff. So <laughs> I started seeing a couple of years ago um, as as the sort of LGBT movement started to to really take off. Um, and you had people who were born female and were interested in transitioning to be male um, using testosterone because that's, that's the way you do it. Right. So, so testosterone is, is literally the medicine that helps make the person who's born female, um, make that, that gender role switch to change their gender and, and sex to become male. And so at some point I started reading articles that started to question whether the controlled substance status for this drug was fair and equitable. Because if you had a person born male who was looking to transition to female and was using estrogen to, to do it, there was, there was no problem. The, the, the reporting, recording restrictions that apply to a controlled substance weren't there. So this really isn't fair. And so um, I remember reading an article not too long ago, maybe three, two, two years ago or so, by a person who was born female uh, and who was looking not to become a man, but looking to simply become more masculine along a non-binary spectrum, essentially to change the way, the way that person looked so that that person would look more masculine. And I remember even reading in the article, giving descriptions of uh, wanted a, a broader shoulders, you know, a more masculine jawline, but not being a man. So, I mean, arguably cosmetic changes, you know, not necessarily full, you know, there's a, there becomes a gray area between what is gender identification and what is just cosmetic. Uh, mm -hmm. but, but this person was very, very critical in saying, why am I, you know, why can't I access 
this drug like any other drug. This is this is and and so I began reading articles from that community saying that the Anabolic Steroid Control Act was anti-trans and 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 some even saying that it was purposely that the purpose of the law was to prevent trans people from accessing this drug and of course you know similar to to, to the issue of you know the DEA uh, proposed rule being all about the TRT community which it never was i think we tend to think that the purpose of any sort of legislation or rules is really to affect me if it does in fact affect me. And so um, ultimately it got enough attention that two U.S. senators actually wrote a letter um, proposing or, or you know, calling for the uh, descheduling, the removal of testosterone from the Controlled Substances Act or at a minimum, taking it from Schedule 3, which is where it is, down to a Schedule 5 so that there's more leniency, et cetera, um, because of its impact on the trans community. So, you know, I, I had never, in all my years of doing this, I've never seen somebody at that level of politics coming out and saying, we need to take testosterone out of the Controlled Substances Act. Um, yeah. So that's a that's a new development. Um, whether that you know that sort of trans movement is going to be enough to really get some change in the scheduling, I don't know. I know a lot of bodybuilders who are now yeah. applauding the trans community, and and suddenly you know there's, sure. there's a lot of support because. Um, you know, there's a, a, a kindred, uh, you know, a mutual um, interest there. But um, do I think that it's going to change soon? I, I don't. Um, I think that, um, you know, but but then again, you know, I guess it's possible that it could there could be some rule or leeway specifically for those who are transitioning uh, and, and in a way that doesn't make it as lenient for the vast, the vast majority of people who are using it non-medically are not transitioning. They're, they're as we said, there's it's cosmetic users um, who are just people, you know, guys, born guys who want to just look more muscular. Um, so, um, but it, it's an interesting topic and it's going to be interesting mm -hmm. to see how it plays out. And I was surprised to see that in the last few years. Yeah, we're hopeful. Um, kind of want to pivot because now we've established that there's these laws. Um, <clears throat> something I never really thought about until listening to you speak, and it scared the crap out of me for all the... Uh oh <laughs> <laughs> no, just, I try not just, to uh, do that. <laughs> no, no, I mean, I, I'm sure a lot of our listeners, like you know, I have in the past, have used underground stuff because of how hard it is to get. Um, and you told a story about uh, an unfortunate female who was going to be charged with one vial, you know, one 10 cc vial of testosterone. Um, what are guys looking at if they are, you know, ordering this stuff recreationally? What kind of um, what trouble could they get into? Yeah, and, and that's a great story, and I've told it on other podcasts, it's and it's um, it's just a, an amazing thing where it, you know, you really realize how much trouble you can get in. Um, yeah. And it varies um, at the federal level versus the state level. And there are state laws. Each state has its own laws with respect to controlled substances, including testosterone and anabolic steroids. Um, in some states, if you have a, a few tablets of black market, Dianabol, it's a misdemeanor. And with a misdemeanor now, you're probably looking at some sort of deferred sentence or probation or something like that. In other states, it's a felony. And even one tablet or one vial, one amp of an anabolic steroid is a, is a felony. And so um, in those states, it's, it's certainly more serious. At the federal level, um, the possession of any anabolic steroid for a, you know, without a prescription um, is a misdemeanor. Once you do it, once you possess it with the intent to sell it, then, then it becomes a felony. And if you do sell it or attempt to sell it, then it's a felony as well. And the punishments in the federal courts are based on the amount. So a small amount, you're probably not looking at jail time. 
larger amount, you are looking at potentially maybe probation or a small amount of jail. Um, massive amounts if you're an underground lab and you're you're making and selling gear, you know, to, to make a living. And I've represented people who were large scale traffickers, you know, literally millions of dollars, millions of dollars in revenues from gear. Um, yeah, you're looking at more serious jail time. You're looking at prison time that, you know, could be anywhere from three years to, to 10 years in, in that range. And um, it, a lot of the factors depend on whether you had a, a prior conviction, if you've been in trouble before, what your record is, and lots of other, lots of other sure. factors. But, um, you know, years ago, most of the case, a lot of the cases that I saw were from importation of finished products. So customs would catch a package of, you know, a tub of a thousand Thai Anibal, you know, Anibal, you know, the, the Thai version, Thailand version of, of Dianibal. And if they caught that in the mail, well, then they would decide what to do. Sometimes they'd send a seizure notice that basically says, we've got your, your Anibal. And if you think mm -hmm. you should have it, call us and we'll talk about it. And most people <laughs> throw that letter away and, and then they, figure they're probably in a database for future yeah. deliveries but um sometimes the it would be a controlled delivery where a person dressed up who was a federal agent dressed up as a, a letter carrier would deliver it and once the package was accepted they'd execute a warrant and search and sometimes they'd find more steroids in the house and so i saw a lot of those cases and defended a lot of those cases and and one of the big issues in those cases was what amount is indicative of intent to sell, right? So, you know, if you think of it this way, if you're an inexperienced or, you know, you don't know a lot about anabolic steroids and you're a cop or a federal agent who's used to, you know, heroin cases and meth cases, and you find a tub of a thousand tablets, <laughs> you're, you're thinking of that as I've, this is a major dealer. I'm, I'm going to get this guy not realizing that that was like the minimum quantity you could get from some of these Thai sources. So, mm -hmm. and it was purely for a number of cycles. And obviously bodybuilders have a very different usage pattern than the typical crackhead who's going to smoke some crack and get high. And, and when the crack runs out, goes out, gets some more crack, gets high and goes back and forth. Bodybuilders are pack rats, right? You don't want to get caught in the middle of a cycle and, and not have what you need. So you're going to get maybe even two, three cycles worth. So you, you know, and so you've got quantities that of, of each individual drug and obviously bodybuilders use different stacks. So you'll have, you got some trend, you got some testosterone and, and maybe some orals to kick off. And so suddenly when the cops come in and they see what's in your house, it looks like a, you know, a small scale pharmacy. Mm -hmm. And so I dealt with those cases a lot. I don't see as many now because most of the importation is in powder form now. It's not as much finished products. Right. Um, but, um, but I've seen, you know, people can get jammed up in, in lots of ways. I've seen the, the, you know, girlfriend who catches her boyfriend cheating and then calls the cops and says, come on over here. Guess what I've got in the house. My boyfriend is, is selling steroids. And so I've seen that I've seen car stops where, you know, the, you know, bottle of, of gear is laying in the back seat and the cop shines the flashlight in says, mm, what do we got there? So there's all sorts of ways of, of getting jammed up. Uh, yeah, that was a question from one of our listeners was, what is the difference between personal use and distribution? It sounds like it kind of depends on the prosecutor at the time. Is there any? It's, that, that's a uh, absolutely. It is purely subjective standard. There are a few states that actually put specific numbers like numbers of pills or something like that. But that's a minority in the vast majority of situations. It's a purely subjective guess on the part initially of the agents um, and then of the prosecutor of what constitutes um, an amount that is inconsistent with personal use. And I've been called, I've, I've dealt with that in countless cases through the years. I've been called as an expert even to assist other lawyers to bring me in to educate the prosecutor, the court, 
Um, and I've got a, a lot of research that, that actually a peer review journal research that shows the types of cycles, stacks, and quantities that bodybuilders generally use. So that becomes very persuasive. And I think, I think it's just lack of education. I remember hearing once I had a, a case in, in the middle Atlantic states where the uh, police you know, officer on the case said that in his experience, you know, steroid users tend to use like one tablet a day. So when you have, you know, a, a thousand tablets, it has to be for for distribution. And it was like a it was a five milligram tablet. So, I mean, he didn't even understand that there's a difference between an anad a 50 milligram anadrol tablet and a five milligram, right. you know, D-ball tablet. Um so a lot of it is is just trying to you know bring sanity to what otherwise and it's scary because if I was not involved in some of these cases uh, unfortunately most lawyers wouldn't know an an, an anavar from an aspirin right I mean they, yeah. it, it does makes no sense to them so um, and I think a lot of lawyers too is even good defense lawyers have also been misinformed and miseducated by a system that attributes aggression and, and roid rage and all the other things that the media throws on on top of steroids. And so uh, they're not as, uh, you know, um, informed. And, and when the defense lawyer is not informed properly, nothing good's going to happen. Yeah. As a defense uh, attorney, like, you know, listening to you, obviously I'm biased, but I'm trying to think that even if I wasn't in this space, if I heard you speak the way you've talked to us today, I would, I think I would reconsider my thoughts about the law and just say, this is really crazy. And this poor guy, you know, probably a, another professional is getting kind of wrecked over the coals for something that he doesn't really deserve, you know, because he had some testosterone. But, you know, if I was a juror, I'm trying to say it, it would be, okay, this is the law. So we did break it. And of course the jurors can't decide the actual sentence, but are you, when you, uh, you know, kind of convey this to the judge, are you able to drop sentences? You know, do, do, do people kind of listen to you in the, in yeah. the, uh, the courthouse and, and are you successful in that? Yeah, I, I, I'm yeah. very, I'm very grateful that um, I've been able to apply my kind of, you know, like, like Liam Neeson says, I've got a very particular set of skills, right? Yeah. So <laughs> I, I, I'm blessed that I've been able to apply those skills in, in a way that I, I think the vast majority of my clients will tell you that may that that my my role in the in the case, my being in the case, or being their their lawyer in the case, um, made a, a monumental difference in the outcome of how it all went. And yeah, so, so call Rick um, if you ever get in trouble. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, you know, only one call away, as they say. Exactly. Um, you don't have to answer this necessarily if you don't want to be giving out this advice. But I've kind of told people because you talked about dressing up in the the courier outfit. Um, I just in my time online and and you know hearing about it. Every time I heard of a bus, it was because of that, where they come and hand it to you. And I've kind of been, you know, and I think about it, my mail never gets directly handed to me almost ever, you know, almost never does unless it requires a signature. And the company told me that beforehand. So I have told people, you know, if they try to give it to you, just say, that's not mine. I don't know where that came from. I don't, I won't accept it. Would that help? Um, you know, so if I order something from Turkey, it comes, they're dressed up in UPS and they say, here, take this. And I say, I didn't order that. I don't want to accept it. Does that yeah. Keep me off the hook. So, uh, well, I'll preface it by saying nothing in this podcast right. is uh, legal advice. It's it's pure information. 100%. Nothing creates an attorney-client relationship <laughs> just by viewing it. Um, but that being said, I, I will say that uh, most people people make a number of mistakes. Um, obviously, um, when in a controlled delivery situation like that. Uh, if there's if the person has an inkling that it is uh, un, that it is it's not legit that this guy is is giving me a, a product that um, that I don't um, think I should be in possession of, then obviously not taking possession of it is is minimizing the potential downside doesn't mean necessarily that they can't find other evidence that may connect you with that package, right. but that would certainly minimize that. Um, but people make other stupid mistakes. Sometimes um, if, if the person does refuse the package, the agents will come back up and knock on the door and say, okay, 
we <laughs> we know what just happened here. We know that you ordered this package and, and we know it because, you know, we have checked and we see that you tracked it and we know that your IP address is connected to tracking it. Why would you be tracking a package and then you play this game and you 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 refuse it? Um, you know, just talk to us and tell us what happened. And so then you've you know the person's in a situation where they have to make a choice: either they continue to deny and say, "No, I didn't do that. I don't know what you're talking about. I, I you know, well, do, are you involved with steroids? I've never seen a steroid. I don't know what what's a steroid. I don't <laughs> even know what it is." So that's a problem because. That's lying to federal agents in the course yeah. of their investigation. And if you remember a few years ago, there was a celebrity by the name of Martha Stewart who went to prison for, for actually lying to federal agents. Um, it was a stock you know, trade investigation. She didn't do anything wrong. There was no stock mm -hmm. trade problem, but just lying to the agents is a violation of the law. So answering you know lying to federal agents and denying may seem like a good idea but it's not a good idea but admitting it to federal agents is also a bad idea right so yeah. yes i did this because sometimes i've seen it happen a lot the evidence that they have against the person is not quite enough for probable cause it's not quite mm -hmm. enough and once the person opens their mouth and says, well, yeah, I, I, I use steroids or, yeah, I, I did order that package, but I never did it before and I won't do it again or whatever self-serving answers. Once you make that admission, once you incriminate yourself in you know, an inculpatory statement, you know, they're going to be able to use that. And that can be sometimes that's the missing piece that allows mm -hmm. them now to charge you with a crime. So what I always say, general information, not legal advice, mm -hmm. the best bet is always to neither admit nor deny and to simply say the magic words. You know what? I need to speak to my lawyer about this. Mm -hmm. Give me your card. Give me your information. I'm more than happy to cooperate with you and talk with you. But I, he handles these things for me. He'll call you right away and he'll take, he'll set everything up from there. I'm sorry, but smartest name is Rick Collins, smartest guy in the room. <laughs> You're going to love him. You're going to love this guy, but just give me your cards and he'll take care of everything. I promise you. When you say those magic words of, I have a lawyer, my lawyer's going to call you, that is invoking your Sixth Amendment privilege, which basically allows them to. Um, to take that and, and not ask, allows no further questions to be asked. Once a suspect in, you know, invokes his Sixth Amendment right, I have a lawyer, my lawyer is going to call you. They're not supposed to ask any further questions and any answers you give after you say that generally can't be used against you, although you mm -hmm. shouldn't say anything after that. Yeah. And so I've had those situations um, I remember Dave Palumbo, my, my my client at one time, a good friend of mine, once did that when they came to his door. And you know, they they may not be happy about it because obviously it's a it's preventing them from getting the easy the easiest way of, of you walking yourself into handcuffs. But uh, it's certainly the only way that you can ensure that you're not either committing a new crime by lying. Yeah or giving an incriminating statement that is going to be written down mm -hmm. and going to be used as a basis of either getting a warrant or ultimately charging you and bringing you to court. Yeah, that's huge. I think it's a huge takeaway for anything, not only around steroids. And I, I definitely took that away from Rick when I've heard him speak before that, you know, this is a, a right, like, you know, it's your Sixth Amendment right and just use it, you know, and it's smarter. Um, a lot smarter because I didn't even think about that. You know, it would probably be my first reaction to say that's not mine. But as soon as I said that, if they could prove that, now it's a whole nother crime. Yes, you, know? you, you could, could be worse. Exactly, yeah. exactly, and and that's the beauty of the Sixth Amendment. And and just to you know to to make this a little mini course in constitutional rights, if if we want to do that, mm -hmm. um, the the Fifth Amendment is your right against self incrimination. So that means you you can't be forced to give answers that are, you know, going to incriminate you. So um, you can always say, I don't want to answer, but by, by saying, I don't want to answer without my lawyer, you bring the sixth amendment into it, which, which has a greater level of protection. The other, you know, if we're doing amendments, let's just do the fourth amendment 
because right. the Fourth Amendment is the right to privacy, right? It's the right to to be safe and secure in your purse, in your person, your your places and things. And so, when I think about the Fourth Amendment, that comes up very often in the context of consent. So, may I search your car? Do you mind if I come into your house? These are requests that are asking for your consent. Generally, without probable cause, the police can't really search you or do too much. And without a warrant, they can't come into your house absent, you know, certain, you know, specific circumstances. So, you know, the requirement for a warrant, the requirement for probable cause goes out the window if you consent. If you mm -hmm. say, sure, you know, do you mind if I, I, I search your trunk if, in a car stop? And I think people generally law abiding folks want to be cooperative they mm -hmm. they want to acquiesce to authority and also there's this idea that if i say no that he'll think i'm guilty mm -hmm. and, and so i i don't want him to think that where the word is Realistically, he already thinks you're guilty. He, right. he, he thought you were. That's why he stopped you in the first place. Mm -hmm. So you're not. You know, th this idea of trying to be, you know, cooperative is really not, you know, changing his mind. But right. once you say, you know, once you answer the question, do you mind if I you know, pop your trunk? I want to take a look in your trunk. Do you mind? And you say, no, no, no. Of course. Uh, here, here you go. You've now consented, and you've thrown out any requirements for probable cause or a warrant. And so whatever he finds in that trunk um, is something he could use. So again, if, if even refusing that package in the, in the example that you gave, and now they come back later in, you know, wearing suits and clearly not letter carriers, mm -hmm. clearly agents, and they knock on the door and do what's called a knock and talk, and they start asking you questions. And then sometimes they'll say, you know, it's a little cold out here, or I think your neighbors are watching. Do you mind if we come in, do you mind if we, we step into the house? And once you let them in, they're free. Certainly anything that's in plain sight at that point mm -hmm. is something, you know, that they could seize if it's contraband or if it's evidence. And so um, generally, again, the, the fourth amendment is, do, do you mind? Actually, I'm going to, I'm going to have my lawyer get back to you on that, but yes, I'm, I'm not consenting. And I tell a story sometimes about, and I'll, I'll make it a shorter version. Uh, I had a client who was on his way back from Mexico and he uh, had a car. His trunk was filled with gear that he got there for him and his buddies. And he was stopped by a trooper and the trooper asked, do you mind if I search your car? And he was wise enough to say, actually, I do. If I'm free to leave, I'd like to leave. And, and the trooper said, well, uh, I'm I'm going to call a canine unit to determine whether you have drugs in your trunk, and that canine is very aggressive. He's you know it's a scary scary dog, and if you make me wait to get that dog here, that dog goes crazy. If he smells drugs, he's going to scratch your car. He may even attack you. We, we do our best, but this is a this is a wild Gosh. wild animal. <laughs> And the guy stuck. He, he stuck to his guns, and he said, "No, I'm not. I'm not consenting." And ultimately, uh, the canine unit comes and walks. The dog walks around the car twice, and then doesn't do anything except sit down. And he hears the um, canine handler say to the trooper who stopped him, "We don't have shit." <laughs> and the trooper comes over and says, "It's a hit." He said, well, wait a minute. No, no, no. He said, he said, shit, not hit. He goes, no, mm -hmm. no, no. The dog hit on the car. He's like, but you said this was a wild dog. There's a wild, oh, no, no, that's a different dog. And sure <laughs> enough, they, they pop open yeah. the trunk and, and the drugs are there. So, you know, even in, in that, luckily in that situation, you're able to challenge whether, mm -hmm. you know, that's a, a proper stop um, and a proper search. And in that case, ultimately at the end of the day, it was determined that the stop was not proper and we were able to salvage the, the, the situation. But um, but he did what was right. He did the right thing because, you know, a lot of people would have just out of 
out of fear and nervousness and, and interest in acquiescing, just said, oh, no, no, I don't mind, you know, and, and somehow hoped that it would magically disappear when the, when the trunk popped. Right. I had another interesting question from a, a listener who asked, if you have a prescription for testosterone through a medical doctor and it's legit, but you source it through underground means, is there an issue with that? Oh, yeah. There's, a, there's an issue because mm -hmm. that's illegal. So, um, you know, a prescription is good as long as your you, the the product that you get is within that prescription. Just because you have a prescription for testosterone doesn't mean you can, you know, go on Instagram and, and you know, get whatever you want. So, yes, it, it's problematic. Um, it's it's not uncommon that when I've represented clients who are uh charge more as possessor, not, not as much distribution, but possession, that they'll say, well, I do have a prescription for testosterone. Um, you know, to what extent that's a judge will look at that and say, well, you know, it's not like he was getting a drug that he didn't need. Um, mm -hmm. But it's still, I think most judges will simply say, you know, you had a prescription. You chose not to stay within that prescription, not to get it from a pharmacist, not to get it from a, an FDA approved source. You went on the black market. How are you different than anybody who didn't have a prescription? And that, that might be the way a judge would see it. Yeah, I kind of figured that as well. And then another another interesting one was about coaches who kind of coach on PEDs. What kind of uh, legality are they facing? You know, if they're not giving or necessarily recommend, I guess they are kind of recommending, you know, they're telling people, bodybuilding coaches, PED coaches, what kind of uh, issues can they face? Yeah, so I've, I've had a number of uh, folks call me in that, in the coaching community when recently there were some deaths, um, mm -hmm. you know, oh, yeah. related to potentially, you know, use of, of some, you know, supplements, uh, pre-contest supplements and, you know, a, a coach who is giving advice on, um, you know, what to use and how much to use uh, certainly could face civil liability for sure. You know, you could you could see how the family of somebody who passes might say, hey, he was following your advice and now he's dead. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, you you need to be held accountable. Um, whether, um, you know, at what point the, the conduct rises to criminal, I think is, is fact sensitive. Certainly at, at the low end of it would be a coach who just says, listen, I'm not getting, getting involved in, in your drug regimens. Um, but, um, you know, you probably should use X, Y, and Z. I'm not being involved in sourcing it, you know, but that's, that's what a lot of people would, would use. And that's what I recommend. That's probably at the low end, probably not mm -hmm. actionable at the higher end is coach who says, okay, talk to my guy. Here's, you know, here's my guy, here's his number. Well, you know, arguably it's a, it's a facilitation and, and yeah. possibly accomplice liability um, that um, is problematic. Yeah. On a similar note, um, I got called out recently on a, a YouTube channel by good old Nick Tragilli. I'm not sure if you're familiar with him, but he likes to call out everybody in space. And he called me a shady doctor and definitely took a, a clip out of context saying that yeah. I was prescribing trend or telling people to use trend, which I wasn't. But what I did say was that if somebody is using these. Given just, I had given enough power for a little over an hour. Oh, uh, sorry about that. Thought. So I just plugged it in. Oh, so I'm all, right. all of us. Yeah. All right. <laughs> so, yeah, what I was saying is, um, you know, I, I had said on a podcast that if you were to come to like our clinic, we cannot help you. We can't prescribe these things. We can't tell you how to do these things, but we can help to keep you safe while you're doing them. And in my, the way that I thought about it is, you know, if a heroin addict comes into a clinic, you know, we can give them clean needles. We can tell them some, you know, we can give them some general advice to keep them healthy. Do you think the same is so for steroids, you know, I have a, somebody who's using trend and obviously I tell them, I don't think you should be doing trend for X, Y, and Z, but if you are going to do so, let's talk about how to modulate your blood pressure and your lipids right. and everything. Right. Is there, am I at risk? It's a tough call. 
you know, yeah. uh, it's, I don't know if there's any easy answer to that. You know, it, it, it depends is usually the fallback uh, answer right. that lawyers give that everybody hates. Mm -hmm. But I, I think that's, Scientists that's too. true. Um, you know, at what point is, is the con does the conduct reach the point of facilitating or encouraging the continuation mm -hmm of the illicit behavior i think becomes the the question how how forceful the um admonitions are not to continue um you know there are some doctors who i think would err on the side of giving up that patient and say you know what uh if you're not willing to stop your illegal drug use which i think is not good for you uh, i can't be your doctor anymore um, is that a requirement? And if so, at what point would that be a requirement? I don't know if there's any yeah. hard and fast laws on on any of that. Uh, you know, there, it, it really depends. And, and I guess what what happens if you know uh, under a worst case scenario, the patient dies yeah. um, as a result of arguably some of the cornucopia of drugs that he was using that. Um, you know, that you weren't involved with. And now the family says, well, Dr. Adam knew that he was using all these drugs. What did he do to stop him? What did, what did, you know, if anything, by monitoring his use, he was implicitly, tacitly, you know, encouraging him to continue. Mm -hmm. um, could that claim be made? I suppose. Uh, and then it would be fact sensitive to, you know, what did the doctor do to try to discourage it or to, you know, to end it? Um, it, it it's tough because, of course, on the other hand, you know, if doctors walk away from patients just because they're not compliant with every aspect of what the doctor is recommending, you know, you're putting you're putting people in more at more risk, you know, right. um, having a doctor to monitor even, you know, problematic behavior um, is is necessary. You know, you go to the doctor and you say, I'm, I'm drinking, you know, two quarts of scotch a day. Um, at what point does the doctor have to say, well, unless you stop drinking that scotch, you know, I'm going to uh, not be your doctor anymore. You exactly. know, uh, certainly. I think from a societal interest standpoint, we want to encourage doctors not to just walk away from patients. And that would be my argument. But but these are the sorts of things, I guess, where you've got competing, you know, social policy interests and, and you know, it would have to shake out sometimes in the context of courts. Yeah, absolutely. That makes sense, I guess. I, yeah, I think, you know, with medical, it's always weird because you have not only the legality, but more often it's more the medical board that you have to talk to and convince. Sure. Right. Um, and then, then you have to deal with potential. And the medical boards are not very TRT friendly as a general rule, you know, no. um, unfortunately, I think a lot of them are, are not very TRT friendly. Right. Um, I've been in front of medical licensing boards that were, um, largely made up of endocrinologists and and you know traditional orthodox endocrinology has a very very different idea on trt than yeah. a lot of the wellness clinics and in trt clinics do yeah absolutely completely agree well josh do you have some questions and then yeah, we can wrap just, up here rick don't want to keep you too long but this is awesome right. i could talk to you all day yeah, no, there's Absolutely. there's so much more we could talk about, um, you know, and I liked even some of the stuff that you guys cover in in terms of motivation and inspiration and, and all I that. I'd love Maybe to talk about that stuff. Do that another day, you know. Um, you know, I do write a lot about stuff like that and about, um, you know, the the masculinity crisis as it's uh, unfolding in America. And I wrote a book a few years ago. Well, I wrote two books. I wrote Legal Muscle back in, you know, uh, 2002. Uh, kind of a, an analysis of, of steroids in American law, culture, politics, you know, sports, entertainment, um, bodybuilding. And then a few years later, I uh, co-wrote a book called Alpha Male Challenge, which was kind of a, a diet and exercise uh, and mindset book uh, for 
for guys maybe 30 and up to kind of reclaim their their best self uh, alpha male challenge alpha male being kind of the idea of how to be your best how to be you know at the top of your game without being an asshole uh, yeah. was, so, was sort of the the idea of it um and and part of that was inspired by as you know the um the diminishing levels at the generational level of of testosterone so you know our grandfather's testosterone levels on average were higher than our dad's and our dad's levels on average were higher than ours and so mm -hmm. we've got this gradual decrease in testosterone levels over time gen generation after generation which obviously is going to have all sorts of potential impacts as time goes on and so this kind of reclaiming your your best self and and you know reclaiming a testosterone fueled life that's that's positive and and healthy um and puts you at uh, at an advantage was what the book was about um and so i like i certainly talk and write a lot about those issues um and maybe we can cover that some other day i would i would absolutely love that yeah we'll just uh We'll have this will be one of X, you know, a lot of future ones, hopefully. Um, I was wondering back when we were talking, you know, the fact that we can kind of bigorexia, anorexia, things like that, this body dysmorphia is a diagnosable issue. Do you think that there would be that it would ever stand up in court or in front of a medical board that somebody prescribes to potentially treat that? That's a great, great question. And um I'll, I'll have to send you There's There's probably a link to it on my um, Instagram bio, uh, a piece that um, I wrote uh, with two co-authors a few years ago, um, which which kind of started when I wrote a column in Muscular Development Magazine, where I still write every month uh, about sort of comparing the idea of testosterone in the context of that what we talked about before female to male uh mm -hmm. trans you know that which which also is a diagnosable dsm-5 disorder right it's mm -hmm. gender dysphoria hey i've been born in this body this body is a woman's body but i i'm a man i i should be in a man's body and so that gender dysphoria when it's a female to male is treated with testosterone. That's the drug of choice, right? So, so I'm now changing my identity, my image, how I see myself using testosterone to treat this identity disorder. Well, muscle dysmorphia is also kind of a self-image DSM-5 uh, disorder. And that is, I look in the mirror, I see this puny, scrawny guy, even though when I get on the scale, um, 250 pounds and I'm, you know, 8% body fat. So, so that sort of disconnect between what my body, my, the phenotype of my body and how I envision myself and what would make me comfortable you know, and, and so I looked at that issue and the the disparity, there are certainly similarities there. And I'm not saying they're identical issues, obviously, proportionally, et cetera, there's, there's differences, but there is some similarity there. And that is with respect to the gender dysphoria issue, we treat it with testosterone. Okay. You know, rather than saying to the person, well, you just need to be happy. That's how you look and you need to do what you can to change it naturally, but you can't use a drug to change the way you look. Um, no, we, we say absolutely. And, and to some degree, we, we applaud that in, and celebrate that, that transition in society now. Whereas if you were to go to your doctor and say, hey, um, 200 pounds, but that's not how I see myself. I see myself <laughs> as 240 pounds of shredded beef. And, and <laughs> that, that self-image, I would be happier in my body if I were to look the way that testosterone could help me look. Well, in that case, not only does the doctor tell you, I can't help you, but the doctor sends you away, throws you out of the office. And if you take a self-help remedy to get there, now you're calling me because you've got a mm. criminal issue. So that, that gulf even though I'm, I'm not saying that they're they're the same and you know I, I kind of looked at you know is the difference sufficient 
to justify that the the breadth of that difference where one is one is completely accepted the other you're a criminal and stigmatized for life it is is the disparity great enough to warrant that so i did an md piece on it um and then i i coordinated with with two other uh, academicians who are friends of mine. And we wrote a, a journal piece, which we submitted to the Journal of Drug Addiction um, on this issue of comparing testosterone for muscle dysmorphia versus gender dysphoria. And, and you know, it was tough to get through the peer review process because, you know, it was like, wow, you know, are, are you... Are you saying that we should treat everybody, you know, who wants to get bigger with testosterone? Well, no, we're not saying that, you know. But the question is, should we be putting them in jail, you know, particularly right. people who have this? And and so ultimately, with some tweaks, um, it, it, you can read it online, um, and it looks at this very you know exact issue that I don't think anybody's really thought about or talked about since before or since. Yeah, that'd be awesome. I would also like to see. It for possibly depression, because I think there's yeah. um, even some peer reviewed literature out there showing that there is an implication in, you know, lower testosterone, hypogonadal men and depression. And what would stop a psychiatrist, you know, like our friend, uh, Dr. Miltek or something from prescribing testosterone for the pure issue of depression? Um, for some reason, that's kind of shunned upon, but we will give, you know, SSRIs, which have a host of issues, mm -hmm. you know, the complications associated with them or various stimulants and things. It's, it's kind of wild. Right. I, I, I could kind of see that changing over time um, mm -hmm. as it becomes more accepted because it, it, it is arguably it would be a medical use. So yeah. it, it, it's not so much, I think, a, a matter of whether it complies with the law, but whether it meets medical ethics and, and yeah. standards, you know, because as doctors, you're bound by, you know, the community standards. And yeah. once you kind of deviate from that, that's when you want, wind up in front of a medical licensing board and, and all of that unpleasantness. Exactly. Well, that's tough. Well, I don't want to keep you too much longer. I know you got some bodybuilders to go defend. Um, <laughs> I, do. I just got a call from a new guy in uh, a Southern state who's got a problem. So I'll be addressing that this afternoon. Well, I always hope that I never meet you on uh, in a business sense, you know, but it's uh, so much fun to talk. Well, unless you want to, maybe you want to come out with your own supplement line, your own brand. and I'm happy Exactly. To that. Okay. Yeah. yeah. But hopefully you're never defending us for doing anything. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I would love to, to get you back on, Rick. So everybody stay tuned because I... I definitely wanted you all to hear this, which Josh and I both heard this from right before because we're large fans. But if you have an especially younger generation coming up, they don't even know what muscular development is, unfortunately. Um, so I wanted you guys to hear this history. Uh, and I think it's really cool. You're in a really interesting niche of law, and it's awesome because it, it relates to what we do. So I wanted to get this out of the way. But in the future, we would love to pick your brain on masculinity and motivation and, you know, personal development and that aspect of human optimization, mm -hmm. which is huge. So it would be yes. great. Yeah, that would be fantastic. And if anybody awesome. wants to find me, I'm pretty easy to find. You can follow me on Instagram at Rick Collins ESQ uh, or visit me uh, on the web at rickcollins.com. Um, I'm very available for uh, consultations. And if anybody needs help, I'm a call away. We're going to put all his info down below. Um, also, a shout out to our friend Allie, who we had on the podcast a few weeks ago. Um, you'll be speaking at her event coming up in Austin, right? I will. Yeah, Allie's awesome. Allie Gilbert is fantastic. And uh, the Silverback Summit uh, is going to be a lot of fun. And um, will you be there in Austin? Will yep. you be joining? Yep. Okay. Yep. So Josh fantastic. and I'll both be there. So we'll, all three of us will be there. Allie, Perfect. Allie asked a question too. She wanted to know whose arms were bigger, yours or hers. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I had her in this office and we did her podcast. She came here in person to do it. And, um, we did some arm comparing, uh, I think she knows whose arm is bigger, but for, you know, <laughs> hers is no joke. I'll tell you that. I know. You know, it's not, she's I'm not, impressive yeah. and, you know, um, and her legs are, are ridiculously jacked. I know I'm going to have to just start my bulk right now to get ready for November <laughs> to be around all you guys. But, <laughs> she's got a it great, was awesome. yeah, she, she's great. I, you know, fantastic. So yeah, so hopefully we get we see all of you. The three of us will see you in Austin. Um, support Allie's cause; it's great. It's definitely all about just becoming a better male, you know, in a 100%. in a dwindling a male dwindling society, you know, where where masculinity is uh, falling by the wayside. Yeah.
That's for yeah. sure. So, all right. Thanks so much, Rick. We'll see all you guys in the uh, next episode.